Hello, John Terrell here. Today we've got part one of my review of Adventures in Forgotten Realms, MTG AFR, the upcoming Dungeons and Dragons magic set. We'll be talking about the cards that I'm including in and excluding from my higher powered cube, Alaysis, my 450 card vintage unpowered cube. Welcome to Cultic Cube, where we cube religiously. We make you better at cube and make your cube better. So today, if you'll indulge me, we'll have a more conversational, freeform chat about what I'm thinking and feeling about the AFR cards that Watsi's offered us. This video is sponsored by Cardamajigs, who's coming out with version 2.0 of their awesome Cubamajig reusable booster packs. So we're going to be talking about cards that I'm adding to Alaysis. This is my vintage unpowered cube. Uh, it's a high power, high octane environment, but it doesn't have the power nine or some of the other most broken cards in the history of magic, but it does have a lot of broken cards in it. So we're looking for cards that can compete with the tinkers of the magic world. And you probably won't be terribly surprised to learn that, in my opinion, AFR doesn't offer an incredible number of tools uh, for the highest power level environments. So I'm adding just four cards from AFR to Alaysis. So that <laughs> wouldn't take me long to talk about these four cards. I think that most of them are pretty straightforwardly good. I would like to touch on some others, though, that have been getting a lot of buzz in the cube community but that I'm not including in my own cube for various reasons. Uh, so we'll, we'll chat about those. In part two of the AFR review, I'll be talking about the cards I'm adding to my lower power environment called Petty Nobility. I'm adding many more cards from the set there. So that is to say, I don't think by any means that the set is just a bust. There are interesting things here. A first note is that I'm not high on the set's signature mechanics. I think that all of these mechanics are too parasitic or involve a bunch of rules baggage that I'm myself not particularly interested in pursuing. So what are these? There's venture into the dungeon, exploration of the dungeon mechanic, and then there's the treasure creation and use mechanic. There are cards that gain additional bonuses when they're cast using mana that's created from treasure tokens. And then the other big one is rolling dice, often a d20, but you know, there are cards that call for rolling different dice, d8s and things. Anyway, I personally strongly dislike die rolling. It just adds additional variance that I don't think is particularly interesting or, or fun. There's enough variance in magic as it is, which is great. It's part of the game. I don't love the die rolling variance myself. You may well have heard me talk about the fact that I run Sword of Dungeons and Dragons in Alaysis, and that calls for a die roll. However, <laughs> my group has eroded the card such that we've taken a sharpie to the die rolling bit. When we play that card, nobody rolls any d20s. Anyway, die rolling not for me either. So in the following list of cards, you're not going to see many, if any, cards that say venture into the dungeon or roll a die or do fancy things with treasure. But that's not to say that those may not be of interest to you. If they sound awesome to you, that's great. Have at it. But I'm afraid I won't be talking about those classes of cards myself. Okay, so let's get into the cards that we are adding to Alaysis. As I said earlier, there's four of them. Two of them are lands, but let's start with the non-land cards. So first is Portable Hole. Portable Hole is an uncommon. It's a single white pip uh, for an artifact. When Portable Hole enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent an opponent controls with mana value two or less until Portable Hole leaves the battlefield. So this card is really quite straightforward. It's extremely inexpensive interaction. So this is going to be premium interaction, particularly in the early game, but you're going to be able to find targets for this at most points of the game, I would imagine. In some senses, it's sort of a catch-all, right? It's not limited to hitting creatures. It's a non-land permanent that costs two or less. That's pretty great. I think that this card is going to be great in my environment. I could see how it could be worse elsewhere. So reasons that it might be worse include if one's environment has a great deal of shatter effects. And artifacts do tend to be easier to blow up than enchantments. So there's that. 
I mean, I make that note just because this effect in white is usually tacked onto an enchantment, right? Like an oblivion ring sort of thing. Um, this is unusual for being a white artifact that exiles. Also, my environment is rather lean. There are lots of aggressive decks that have quite low curves. If your environment tends to go bigger, portable hole could well go down in value, of course. But cheap early interaction looks awesome. Next up, we've got a black uncommon. Power word kill. It's one in a black for an instant. It says destroy target non-angel, non-demon, non-devil, non-dragon creature. Okay, so that sounds like a lot of caveats there. <laughs> That's a whole long list of things that it doesn't hit. But what does that mean? Well, as you probably suspect, despite the wordiness of that list, this card actually doesn't miss on a lot. This card hits a lot. So I've run some numbers on various Doomblade variants and their efficacy in Aleasis. In Aleasis, I've got 179 creatures. Here, I've just counted creatures full stop. I haven't counted token producing spells or spells that turn other permanents into creatures or any of that kind of stuff. Okay, so here's the rundown. Doomblade misses on 30 of 179 creatures. That represents 17% of the creatures in the cube where Doomblade fails. Ultimate price misses on 24 creatures, which is 13%. Cast down misses on just one fewer, so it misses on 23 creatures, which is also 13%. Go for the throat misses on 16, which is 9%. Here we're doing about twice as well as Doomblade. Although I suppose there are definitely going to be more artifact tokens than black tokens in general. Okay, power word kill, you guys, misses on six creatures. That's 3% of the creatures in the cube. Six. There are only six misses in the entire cube. That's pretty remarkable. So again, your mileage may vary, of course. Maybe you've got angel tribal in the cube or something. I don't know. In which case, this thing will plummet in value. But I suspect if you go through and perform a similar exercise in your own cube, if your cube looks anything like mine, Power Word Kill is excellent and may well be the best of the Doomblade variants. Okay, let's talk lands now. So we've got a cycle of five rare monocolored creature lands. So let's talk about the two that I am adding, and then we can use this as a segue into the cards that I'm not adding to the cube but would like to discuss, and we'll, we'll chat about those other lands. So firstly, Cave of the Frost Dragon. This is a rare land. If you control two or more other lands, Cave of the Frost Dragon enters the battlefield tapped. It's got two abilities, tap to add a white mana, or pay four in a white, and Cave of the Frost Dragon becomes a 3-4 white dragon creature with flying until the end of the turn. It's still a land. This card bears obvious comparison to Celestial Colonnade. Activation cost is in fact the same, although Celestial Colonnade has Vigilance, so that allows you to tap it for mana after you've attacked with it, of course. So that sort of gives you a discount on it. You end up with a creature that has flying in both cases, the stats are worse, though, on this than on Celestial Colonnade, of course. This is a 3-4 instead of a 4-4. But there are some big upsides to this thing, too. It's just one color, right? Here's a mono... this is a monocolored land. Also, it has the potential to enter untapped, unlike Celestial Colonnade. That's a big game, too. So yes, this thing is a little expensive to activate. The body's not amazing, although 3-4 is, you know, 3-4 flyer, that's not bad. It does seem key that it has 4 toughness instead of 3. It's not the easiest thing in the world to kill. It's going to miss Bolt and Syrian Spear and that kind of thing. That's great. Here's a monocolored creature land that can just go in any deck. This is good in the same way that the MDFC are good, as we've talked about at length in the last year or so. Here's a spell that occupies a land slot. If you draft this card, you stick it in your deck. This is a card that's not contributing to the 23 cards, give or take, that are in the spells slot that you're putting in your deck. Drafting lands is awesome. Every land that you draft is unlocking an additional pick that's going into your main deck instead of just rotting away in your sideboard. So here's a land that can be a 3-4 flyer. Here's a land, by the by, that can go in an aggressive deck. 
particularly since this has the ability of entering untapped, its value goes way up in aggressive decks. You don't have to be an exactly white-blue, which is very often going to be control colors, in order to put this in the deck, so you can stick this in your white weenie deck and be happy. Or in your control deck, All right. Anyway, I think this is an excellent card, I think it's the best of the cycle. The next card in the cycle that I'm adding to Eleasis, and in fact the final card I'm adding to Eleasis, is Den of the Bugbear. This is a rare land. If you control two or more other lands, Den of the Bugbear enters the battlefield tap. It has tap to add a red mana. And then it has three and a red. Until end of turn, Den of the Bugbear becomes a 3-2 red goblin creature with... Whenever this creature attacks, create a 1-1 red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking. It's still a land. So here we've got a little rabble land. Of course this thing's not nearly as good as Rabble Master in many senses, but this is great insurance for the aggressive red deck, I think. So you do have to activate this thing and attack. You can potentially be doing things like you activate this thing and when they go to block it, you shock their blocker and your den of the bugbear survives and now you've got a 1-1. That's fine, but that's actually quite a mana commitment to be doing those sorts of shenanigans. You need mana and you need cards to be doing that kind of thing. For me, the most likely use case for den of the bugbear being activated is you're playing an aggressive red deck, your opponent wraths the board, now you've got a clean board, but you've got den of the bugbear on the battlefield, so next turn you activate it and you start rebuilding your board. I think this card is probably totally fine. I'm anxious to give it a whirl. I think it's got potential as a little bit of wrath insurance and as a kind of free spell that you're sticking in your deck by virtue of it being a land. All right, let's move on to those cards that I'm not putting in my cube. So to continue that cycle of lands, there are of course three more of them. There's Hall of the Storm Giants, I won't read you the text on all these, but this one is the one that taps for blue. You can pay six and it becomes a 7-7 seven, seven blue giant creature with ward three. There's Hive of the Eye Tyrant. It taps for black and you can pay three and a black to turn it into a 3-3 three, three black beholder creature with menace and some other trinket text on it. Whenever this creature attacks, exile target card from defending player's graveyard. And then finally, we've got Lair of the Hydra. Taps for green, you can spend X and green, and it becomes an XX green Hydra creature. Okay, all of these I think are totally fine, in as much as I think that creature lands are good as a general rule. It's sort of hard to make them bad. Or maybe it's not hard to make them bad, but I think all of these are totally fine, totally serviceable. Stick them in your cube and try them. Why not? For me, probably the next best among these is the black one, since it has evasion in the form of menace. So that seems good. And then it can hate on reanimator strategies and that kind of thing, I guess. If I were testing another one, that'd be the next one I would stick in. I'm not that high on the 3-3 menace, though. It's not getting me that excited. I recognize the red one is just a 3-2, but it's producing bodies and expanding my board. Seems better. I think probably the next best among these is the green one. It turns into this Hydra. You know, if this thing had Trample, then this would be in much more serious conversation for me. Imagine you pay two into Lair of the Hydra. So you have to pay green, and then you have X equals one. So now you've got yourself a 1-1, one, one, and then you turn that 1-1 one, one sideways to attack. You know, that's effectively removing the possibility of creating another mana from your mana pool. So what I'm getting at is, to make a 1-1 one, one takes 3 mana. You put 4 mana into it and you get a Grizzly Bear. Lair of the Hydra isn't the worst thing in the world, but the rate isn't amazing. But you could still make a great big monster with it if you've got infinite mana. And then the final one is Hall of the Storm Giants. You're paying 6 and tapping this thing when you attack, so you're paying 7 to make a 7-7 seven, seven blue giant that is, like, hard for them to Doomblade. I don't know. This thing seems big and dorky and expensive, and I'm not in it for Hall of the Storm Giants. Other cards, all right, let's talk about the Demi Lich next. The Demi Lich is a mythic. It costs, are you all ready for this? It costs blue, 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 blue. That's four blue mana pips for a creature, Skeleton Wizard, and it's a 4-3. 
So that already sounds outrageous, but the text box is cool. This spell costs one blue mana less to cast for each instant and sorcery spell you've cast this turn. Whenever Demi-Lich attacks, exile up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard, copy it, you may cast that copy. And then finally it says you may cast Demi-Lich from your graveyard by exiling four instants and or sorcery cards from your graveyard in addition to paying its other costs. So this card, wow, I mean the text box is exciting, right? Like all, <laughs> every single line of text there sounds great. But obviously the rate on the card isn't that impressive in lots of other ways. So blue, 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 blue is crazy, right? So Eleasis should be one of the better environments for Demi Lich. Eleasis has a ton of cantrips, as I'm sure you know, since I'm always banging on about cantrips and cycling and Xerox theory. So you have the opportunity to pick up plenty of versions of Preordain and Opt and Ponder and also two mana variants and so on. Nevertheless, though, it's still quite an ask to go. I mean, imagine the turn where you play Preordain and then you play Opt. And so now you've paid two spells, so it costs two blue less to cast Demi Lich. That's cool, although you've already spent two blue, right? Now you need to spend another blue and blue to cast Demi Lich. This is possible. This is a thing that could be done, but this scenario demands that you've got three pretty specific cards and that you've got four blue mana sources. This is a lot of hoops to jump through. And then once you've cast the thing, it doesn't actually do anything. It just sits there. Uh, and if it just eats removal, then you've jumped through a whole bunch of hoops probably in order to get this on the field and then it didn't get to do its cool stuff because it's an attack trigger that allows you to exile the instant or sorcery and flash it back. So Demi Lich, I'm personally kind of down on it, but I don't think it's by any means crazy to test the card, especially if you've got an environment that's got a lot of cheap spells. I guess one other note about Demi Lich is there's a deck that wants this card, and that deck is the incredibly blue heavy, spells heavy deck, right? That's probably like a blue red spell slinger sort of thing. Cultic Cube is supported by you. I have a Patreon with all sorts of cool perks, such as collections of art assets from my videos, beautifully formatted cube articles. Also, I've got affiliate relationships with TCG Player, Inked Gaming, and Amazon. Purchases made via my affiliate links, which you can find in the video description, will benefit me at no additional cost to you. Your support means the world to me. It allows me to continue doing what I love, which is talking about Cube. So thank you. All right, let's move on to the red ones. We've got Burning Hands. This is an uncommon. It's one in a red for an instant. Burning Hands deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker. If that permanent is green, Burning Hands deals six damage instead. So there's a whole cycle of these color-hating cards. A first note is just that these color-hating cards irk me <laughs> for similar reasons as color protection irks me and like the swords of X and Y irk me. I don't love random hate on X percent of the field that you'll be playing against. And I don't like cards that are otherwise sideboard cards and then you pull them out and then, you know, they become A pluses against a color. So I'm predisposed not to like this cycle of cards. Burning Hands is, to my recollection, among the best of these. So the fail case is it's this two mana shock, but it only hits creatures and planeswalkers, right? Which is, you know, okay. So two mana to deal two damage to a creature or planeswalker. If the thing is green though, oh my goodness, it does six damage instead and that's a big game. That's a really big game. Two mana instant, deal six damage, sign me up. So I think that the fail case isn't terrible. You know, this isn't like a totally embarrassing card to have in the deck. And then some percentage of the time, oh boy, the card gets like way better than it is otherwise. I don't think this card is awful. It may be that other cards in the cycle are good as well. By all means, try it out if this seems like your thing. Not my thing though. 
And if numbers had been tweaked such that this did a better approximation of a shock, I mean, if this were just a red mana to deal two, even to target creature or planeswalker, that's fine. And then it did like way more damage to green. You know, it did five to a green permanent or something. I'd be into the card. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay, Inferno of the Star Mounts. It's a crazy name. This is a dragon. It is a mythic. It's four red red for a legendary creature. Dragon. It's a 6-6. Six, six. It can't be countered, okay? It's got flying. It's got haste. And it's got fire breathing. You can pay a red mana. Inferno of the Star Mounts gets plus one, plus O oh until end of the turn. And whenever its power becomes 20 this way, it deals 20 damage to any target. That's cool, I guess. You can just assassinate people, although, you know, you, you actually have to be spending the mana to do it, right? They want to make sure that you don't just start suiting it up with equipments or auras, and then additionally, you pump some mana into it. I think this card is good if you're in the market for six mana red finisher. I think there's a conversation to be had about how this stacks up against Inferno Titan, and in, in some ways, it sort of embarrasses Inferno Titan. I mean, at least in the sense that it's got evasion and it's got haste. All of that's really good. However, Inferno Titan has the enters the battlefield trigger and you get that arc lightning value even if Titan eats removal immediately. I still think Titan's probably the better card, but this has a lot to recommend it. So if you're looking for another big finisher in red, this is definitely a thing to look at. I want to give a shout out though to Emissary of Grudges as well. I don't run that card anymore, but I did for a long time and I like it. Let me read you the card. Emissary of Grudges. This is five and a red for a creature, a freet. It's a six five. It's got flying, it's got haste. This sounds familiar. It sounds like our new friend. It's got a bunch of commander specific text that we don't care about, but I'll cut to the chase. When an opponent casts a spell targeting you or a permanent you control, you can choose new targets for that spell or ability. You can only do this one time. So when opponent goes to Doomblade Emissary of Grudges, one time it's got this amazing shield that the opponent has to break through. Better than a shield, right? Because it allows you to redirect the spell and kill one of their things. This thing's super hard to get rid of. Like this card, you resolve this card, it either kills them or they have to jump through some hoops to get rid of this thing. They have to have a Doom Blade. You redirect that Doom Blade and kill something of theirs and then they have to have another Doom Blade, right? So killing this thing is often a three for one proposition. That's a lot of value. And it's a hasty, evasive creature. So I think this card is very good. I still like Inferno Titan better than Emissary of Grudges, but very good. So all that is to say, I think that this new dragon is cool. It's a totally reasonable card. You should by all means try it out if it's appealing to you and if you're looking for another big red thing. Next, we've got Werewolf Pack Leader. This thing is green, green. It's a rare for a creature, human werewolf. It's a 3-3. Whenever Werewolf Pack Leader attacks, if you attacked with creatures with total power 6 or greater, this combat, draw a card. And it has the ability for 3 and a green. Until end of turn, Werewolf Pack Leader has a base power and toughness of 5-3. It gains trample, and it isn't a human. That's sweet. For 4 mana, you can pump this guy's power by 2 and give it trample. That's a cool thing. And then, of course, you're very near to turning on the um, pack tactics, the thing that cares about the power six, because you're up to power five now. So you just need another thing attacking. I think Werewolf Pack Leader is a super cool card. It's an exciting card for continuing to push green aggressive strategies, which get better and better. It's been received wisdom for years in Cube that you're a fool to try green aggro, right? Now, of course, there's always been ways of making it work. You can do whatever you want in cube, and you can find ways of making making things functional, especially since you're sculpting an environment around the things that you want to make functional. Anyway, green aggro getting more and more legit, and we've talked a lot on this channel about green mid-range strategies and how to push those in ways that are effective. I've got that whole discussion of what I called British racing green in the article that I wrote for Watsi. Werewolf Pack Leader fits brilliantly into that milieu. If I were uh, revisiting the Cultic Cube, 
the cube that appeared on MTGO. I would totally put Werewolf Pack Leader in there. I think this card is great if you're pushing really lean and fast green mid-range. If you're pushing that kind of thing, stick Werewolf Pack Leader in there. I think it's great. It's a two mana 3-3 three, three that does some other things. You know, that's cool. So I don't want to poo-poo this card at all. I think it's a sweet card. I like that it exists. It's just not the card for Alasis um, because I'm not really supporting that deck in Alasis. Next up, we've got a gold card, Minsk Beloved Ranger. This thing's a mythic. It costs Naya, costs red, green, white. Legendary creature, human ranger, it's a 3-3. When Minsk Beloved Ranger enters the battlefield, create Boo, a legendary 1-1 red hamster creature token with trample and haste. Cool, okay. So, you know, we've got a blade splicer here or an attended knight or something. Okay, but Minsk has an ability. You can pay X until end of turn, target creature you control has base power and toughness of XX and becomes a giant in addition to its other types. Activate only as a sorcery. This card, I think, is probably not bad. I mean, the rate for growing your hamster is good. You don't have to grow your hamster. You can grow anything that you want. That's cool. Minsk can even grow himself if he'd like. My friend and colleague Ryan Sachs pointed out that Minsk can also act as a sack outlet. That's cute um, because you could pay X equals zero to kill one of your own things if you're in it for Naya aristocrats somehow. That's a minor thing, but it's a cute thing. So Minsk, I think, is a totally fine card, except that it costs Naya to cast this card. So you all know how I feel about gold cards. I have an allergy to gold cards. <laughs> You know, I run them. I just tend to have rather few in my environment. Although I also curate, you know, Ravnica remastered environments that goes hard into gold. But in my more traditional environments like Alasis, not a ton of gold cards. And gold cards that are three colors, boy, they have to be really special for me to be interested in them. So Minsk is just not for me. But I want to underline that I don't think it's a bad card. Maybe he has a home in your environment. All right, final card I want to touch on is an artifact, Hand of Vecna. It costs three generic mana. It's a rare, legendary artifact equipment. At the beginning of combat on your turn, equipped creature, or a creature you control named Vecna, that's probably not relevant. Anyway, equipped creature you control gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of cards in your hand. So you can equip by paying one life for each card in your hand, or you can equip for two generic mana. This is a card that was brought to my attention by White Wolf 123 WTWLF123. He's been writing set reviews for Cube on MTG Salvation for many years now. White Wolf made the interesting comparison between this card and Grafted War Gear. Grafted War Gear is a great aggressive equipment. I mean, really, one of the best aggressive equipment. And it's a card that's an extraordinarily high pick for me anyway, right? I mean, it's pack one, pick one material in Alasis. Pack one, pick one material in lots of environments, I think. So as White Wolf points out, here's a card that you can cast for three mana and like Grafted War Gear equip immediately, right? At the cost of some life, but you're an aggro deck, you don't care about that. Also, if Grafted War Gear becomes unattached from a creature, of course the creature dies. That's a drawback. That's not much of a drawback though, honestly, right? I, I don't know, maybe it is for you, but for me that's it's like a minor nuisance that comes up every, every now and again when the Grafted War Gear gets shattered, but not often that big a thing. But anyway, that's not a thing at all with Hand of Vecna, right? That's cool. So I think this card's interesting. I think this card is worth trying if you're interested in trying it. I'm, a, I'm still a little dubious about this card because I can see that it can pile on a whole bunch of damage. It's going to do that, though, when you have this in your opener. This is a card that's a, often going to be a terrible top deck. We're talking about aggro decks here. Aggro decks tend to want to spend mana and spend cards. They're not husbanding their resources like a control deck might and jealously hoarding their cards, right? But, I mean, you're not playing Hand to Vecna in that control deck that's jealously guarding its cards. So the cards in hand bonus is going to get slimmer and slimmer really quite rapidly in most aggro decks. Now granted, when you do 
have this card in play, you're going to plan around it and you're going to be trying to hold cards and not play out your lands and so on in order to maintain the bonus. So that's cool. And that is interesting, right? I mean, it makes gives you more decisions to make and pros and cons to weigh. That's a cool thing about the card. More decision points. I like that. But nevertheless, the card's going to be a bad top deck. The card makes mulligans even more punishing, right? So even if you do the card in your opener, but you've mulled down to five or something, card gets worse. Also, the, your creature only gets the plus X plus X bonus at the beginning of combat on your turn. It seems like a major strike against it as well. Granted, we're, we want to be turning our creatures sideways in our aggro decks, but it's kind of weak that we lose the bonus on the opponent's turn. For me, the card's an interesting card. The card could represent a lot of damage, but there's a lot of variance built into this card. It's a swingy card whose value plummets after the first few turns of the game. Oh, we're not done. Sorry, I'm wrong. I had some requests. I asked on Twitter what other cards you all might like to hear me talk about a little bit. So I got a request from at ImpSeal. I had some other people seconding and thirding it. So at any rate, let's talk about this card. Ebon Death, Draco Lich. This is a mythic. It's two black black for a legendary creature zombie dragon. That's cool. It's a zombie dragon. It's a 5-2. It's got flash. That's cool. Got flying. Ebon Death enters the battlefield tapped. Oof, that's not great. And it's got recursion. You may cast Ebon Death from your graveyard if a creature not named Ebon Death Draco Lich died this turn. It's got something like morbid for recursion, although it itself can't have died. So it's not morbid. Anyway, firstly, the card's going to be better with a self-sacrifice theme, right? So that one can turn on morbid at will. And in Eleasis, I don't have an aristocrats theme or a self-sacrifice theme. That's it can be done, but it's not it's not really a thing. The stats are cool. I mean, a five two flyer. That's sweet for four. With Flash, I mean, that's big game, right? But the entering tap is a big drawback. So, of course, you can flash it in on your opponent's end step and then untap with it and swing and so that it like sort of has haste. That's cool, but it's a real sadness that you can't flash this thing in and block. You can't even not flash this thing in and block, um, which is to say you can't play this on your turn and then be able to block with it on your opponent's attacks, right? Because it just enters the battlefield tap whether it gets flashed in or not. I don't love that. What else? The recursion is cool and recursion is powerful. I like it. However, here's this four mana recursive card. Like how likely is it that you're binning this thing? Are you running this in a reanimator deck? And trying to bin it, no. What you're actively trying to bin is something better. Although maybe you can bin this for free somehow, and that's nice. But then still, I mean, again, you're not trying to reanimate this thing either, right? But it does recur from the yard, so that's sweet. But you still have to pay the four mana, and it still has to be true that something has died. So I'm not just super duper excited about this card. I'm, just, I'm trying to imagine the deck that I'm putting Ebb and Death in and being excited. But you should by all means test it and tell me how you like it. And if you are interested in self-sacrifice stuff, then all the more reason to test it. Cardamajigs has been kind enough to sponsor this video. If you're listening to this project, I imagine you're a cube designer. And if you're a cube designer, you've almost certainly heard of and perhaps have Cubamajigs, the reusable booster packs for cube play. These things are awesome, as I'm sure you know. I have had Cubamajigs since their first Kickstarter run, and these were a game changer for me and my group. What an awesome reusable way to organize packs and to organize packs beautifully with super cool art on there. I just got in the mail today production samples of the new Cubamajig packs, which come in sets of 10 in these cool collectible boxes that feature the art that's also on the booster packs. And the art is, in fact, awesome. It's super cool stuff. The Kickstarter launches in mid-July. Go to cubeks.com to be redirected to the Kickstarter. Join me in supporting small business that's developing innovative products for our favorite format. So that's all I have for you for AFR discussion vis-a-vis -vis my higher powered format. Next time we'll chat about my lower powered format where we're adding a bunch of cards. I don't remember how many, 15 maybe? So let's keep hanging out and chatting cube.